Section 7 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 7 stems bear leaves at definite points and these are produced in a great variety of forms and subserve various uses the commonest kind of leaf which therefore may be taken as the type or pattern is an expanded green body by means of which the plant exposes to the air and light the matters which it imbibes exhales certain portions and assimilates the residue into vegetable matter for its nourishment and growth but the fact is already familiar that leaves occur under other forms and serve for other uses for the storage of food already assimilated as in thickened seed leaves and bulb scales for covering as in bud scales and still other uses are to be pointed out indeed sometimes they are of no service to the plant being reduced to mere scales or rudiments such as those on the rootstocks of peppermint or the tubers of jerusalem artichoke these may be said to be of service only to the botanist in explaining to him the plan upon which a plant is constructed accordingly just as a rootstock or a tuber or a tendril is a kind of stem so a bud scale or a bulb scale or a cotyledon or a petal of a flower is a kind of leaf even in respect to ordinary leaves it is natural to use the word either in a wider or in a narrower sense as when in one sense we say that a leaf consists of blade and petiole or leaf stalk and in another sense say that a leaf is petioled or that the leaf of hepatica is three-lobed the connection should make it plain whether by leaf we mean leaf blade only or the blade with any other parts it may have and the student will readily understand that by leaf in its largest or morphological sense the botanist means the organ which occupies the place of a leaf whatever be its form or its function leaves as foliage this is tautological for foliage is simply leaves but it is very convenient to speak of typical leaves or those which serve the plant for assimilation as foliage leaves or ordinary leaves these may first be considered the parts of a leaf the ordinary leaf complete in its parts consists of blade footstalk or petiole and a pair of stipules first the blade or lamina which is the essential part of ordinary leaves that is of such as serve the purpose of foliage in structure it consists of a softer part the green pulp called parenchyma which is traversed and supported by a fibrous frame the parts of which are called ribs or veins on account of a certain likeness and arrangement to the veins of animals the whole surface is covered by a transparent skin the epidermis not unlike that which covers the surface of all fresh shoots note that the leaf blade expands horizontally that is normally presents its faces one to the sky the other to the ground or when the leaf is erect the upper face looks toward the stem that bears it the lower face away from it whenever this is not the case there is something to be explained the framework consists of wood a fibrous and tough material which runs from the stem through the leaf stalk when there is one in the form of parallel threads or bundles of fibers and in the blade these spread out in a horizontal direction to form the ribs and veins of the leaf the stout main branches of the framework are called the ribs when there is only one or a middle one decidedly larger than the rest it is called the mid-rib the smaller divisions are termed veins and their still smaller subdivisions veinlets the latter subdivide again and again 
until they become so fine that they are invisible to the naked eye the fibers of which they are composed are hollow forming tubes by which the sap is brought into the leaves and carried to every part venation is the name of the mode of veining that is of the way in which the veins are distributed in the blade this is of two principal kinds namely the parallel veined and the netted veined in netted veined also called reticulated leaves the veins branch off from the main rib or ribs divide into finer and finer veinlets and the branches unite with each other to form meshes of network that is they anastomose as anatomists say of the veins and arteries of the body the quince leaf shows this kind of veining in a leaf with a single rib the maple basswood plane or buttonwood shows it in leaves of several ribs in parallel veined leaves the whole framework consists of slender ribs or veins which run parallel with each other or nearly so from the base to the point of the leaf not dividing and subdividing nor forming meshes except by minute cross veinlets the leaf of any grass or that of the lily of the valley will furnish a good illustration such parallel veins linnaeus called nerves and parallel veined leaves are still commonly called nerved leaves while those of the other kind are said to be veined terms which it is convenient to use although these nerves and veins are all the same thing and have no likeness to the nerves and little to the veins of animals nettle veined leaves belong to plants which have a pair of seed leaves or cotyledons such as the maple beech and the like while parallel veined or nerved leaves belong to plants with one cotyledon or true seed leaf such as the iris and indian corn so that a mere glance at the leaves generally tells what the structure of the embryo is and refers the plant to one or the other of these two grand classes which is a great convenience for when plants differ from each other in some one important respect they usually differ correspondingly in other respects also parallel veined leaves are of two sorts one kind and the commonest having the ribs or nerves all running from the base to the point of the leaf as in the examples already given while in another kind they run from a midrib to the margin as in the common pickerel weed of our ponds in the banana in kala and many similar plants of warm climates netted veined leaves are also of two sorts as in the examples already referred to in one case the veins all rise from a single rib the midrib such leaves are called feather veined or penny veined or pinnately veined both terms meaning the same thing namely that the veins are arranged on the sides of the rib like the plume of a feather on each side of the shaft in the other case the veins branch off from three five seven or nine ribs which spread from the top of the leaf stalk and run through the blade like the toes of a web-footed bird hence these are said to be palmately or digitately veined or since the ribs diverge like rays from a centre radiate veined since the general outline of leaves accords with the framework or skeleton it is plain that feather veined or penny veined leaves will incline to elongated shapes or at least to be longer than broad while in radiate veined leaves more rounded forms are to be expected a glance at the following figures shows this forms of leaves as to general outline it is necessary to give names to the principal shapes and to define them rather precisely since they afford easy marks for distinguishing species the same terms are used for all other flattened parts as well such as petals so that they make up a great part of the descriptive language of botany it will be a good exercise for young students to look up leaves answering to these names and definitions beginning with the narrower 
and proceeding to the broadest forms a leaf is said to be linear when narrow several times longer than wide and of the same breadth throughout lanceolate or lance shaped when conspicuously longer than wide and tapering upwards or both upwards and downwards oblong when nearly twice or thrice as long as broad elliptical is oblong with a flowing outline the two ends alike in width oval is the same as broadly elliptical or elliptical with the breadth considerably more than half the length ovate when the outline is like a section of a hen's egg lengthwise the broader end downward orbicular or rotund circular in outline or nearly so a leaf which tapers toward the base instead of topward the apex may be oblanceolate when of the lance-shaped form only more tapering toward the base than in the opposite direction spatulate when more rounded above but tapering thence to a narrow base like an old-fashioned spatula obovate or inversely ovate that is ovate with the narrower end down cuneate or cuneiform that is wedge shaped broad above and tapering by nearly straight lines to an acute angle at the base as to the base its shape characterizes several forms such as chordate or heart shaped when a leaf of an ovate form or something like it has the outline of its rounded base turned in forming a notch or sinus where the stalk is attached reniform or kidney shaped like the last only rounder and broader than long auriculate or eared having a pair of small and blunt projections or ears at the base as in one species of magnolia sagittate or arrow shaped where such ears are acute and turned downwards while the main body of the blade tapers upwards to a point as in the common sagittaria or arrowhead and in the arrow-leaved polygonum hastate or halberd shaped when such lobes at the base point outwards giving the shape of the halberd of the olden time as in another polygonum peltate or shield shaped is the name applied to a curious modification of the leaf commonly of a rounded form where the footstalk is attached to the lower surface instead of the base and therefore is naturally likened to a shield borne by the outstretched arm the common water shield the nelumbium and the white water lily and also the mandrake exhibit this sort of leaf on comparing the shield-shaped leaf of the common marsh pennywort with that of another common species is at once seen that a shield-shaped leaf is like a kidney shape or other rounded leaf with the margins at the base brought together and united as to the apex the following terms express the principal variations acuminate pointed or taper pointed when the summit is more or less prolonged into a narrowed or tapering point acute ending in an acute angle or not prolonged point obtuse with a blunt or rounded apex truncate with the end as if cut off square Retus, with rounded summit slightly indented, forming a very shallow notch. Emarginate, or notched, indented at the end more decidedly. Obcordate, that is inversely heart-shaped, where an obovate leaf is more deeply notched at the end, as in white clover and wood sorrel, so as to resemble a cordate leaf inverted cuspidate tipped with a sharp and rigid point mucronate adroitly tipped with a small and short point like a mere projection of the midrib 
aristate, on-pointed, and bristle-pointed are terms used when this mucronate point is extended into a longer bristle form or slender appendage. The first six of these terms can be applied to the lower as well as to the upper end of a leaf or other organ. The others belong to the apex only. As to degree and nature of division, there is first of all the difference between simple leaves, those in which the blade is of one piece. However, much of it may be cut up, and compound leaves, those in which the blade consists of two or more separate pieces, upon a common leaf stalk or support. Yet between these two kinds, every intermediate gradation is to be met with. As to particular outlines of simple leaves, and the same applies to their separate parts, they are entire, when their general outline is completely filled out, so that the margin is an even line, without teeth or notches. Serrate, or sawtooth, when the margin only is cut into sharp teeth, like those of a saw, and pointing forwards. Dentate, or toothed when such teeth point outwards instead of forwards. Crenate, or scallop, when the teeth are broad and rounded. Repand, undulate, or wavy, when the margin of the leaf forms a wavy line, bending slightly inwards and outwards in succession. Sinuate, when the margin is more strongly sinuous or turned inwards and outwards. Incised, cut or jagged, when the margin is cut into sharp, deep and irregular teeth or incisions. Lobed, when deeply cut, then the pieces are in a general way called lobes. The number of the lobes is briefly expressed by the phrase two-lobed, three-lobed, five-lobed, many-lobed, etc., as the case may be. When the depth and character of the lobing needs to be more particularly specified, the following terms are employed. Lobed, in a special sense, when the incisions do not extend deeper than about halfway between the margin and the center of the blade, if so far, and are more or less rounded, as in the leaves of the post oak and the hepatica. Cleft, when the incisions extend halfway down or more, and especially when they are sharp. And the phrases two cleft, or in the Latin form, bifid, three cleft, or trifid, four cleft, or quadrifid, five cleft, or sancafid, etc., or many cleft, in the Latin form, multifid, express the number of the segments or portions parted, when the incisions are still deeper, but yet do not quite reach to the mid-rib or the base of the blade, and the terms two-parted, three-parted, etc., express the number of such divisions. Divided, when the incisions extend quite to the mid-rib, as in the lower part, or to the leaf stalk, which really makes the leaf compound. Here, using the Latin form, the leaf is said to be bisected, trisected, according to the number of the divisions. The mode of lobing or division corresponds to that of the veining, whether pinnately veined or palmately veined. In the former, the notches or incisions or sinuses coming between the principal veins or ribs are directed toward the midrib. In the latter, they are directed toward the apex of the petiole, as the figures show. So degree and mode of division may be tersely expressed in brief phrases. Thus, in the four upper figures of pinnately veined leaves, the first is said to be pinnately lobed, in the special sense, the second pinnately cleft, or pinnatifid, in Latin form, the third pinnately parted, the fourth pinnately divided, or pinnatisected. Correspondingly, in the lower row of palmately veined leaves, the first is palmately lobed, the second palmately cleft, the third palmately parted, the fourth palmately divided, or in other language of the same meaning, 
but now less commonly employed, they are said to be digitally lobed, cleft, parted, or divided. The number of the divisions or lobes may come into the phrase. Thus, in the four last named figures, the leaves are respectively palmately, three-lobed, three-cleft, or trifid, three-parted, three-divided, or better, in Latin form, trisected. And so for higher numbers, as five-lobed, five-cleft, etc., up to many-lobed, many-cleft, or multifid, etc. The same mode of expression may be used for pinnately lobed leaves, as pinnately seven-lobed, cleft, parted, etc. The divisions, lobes, etc., may themselves be entire, without teeth or notches, or serrate, or otherwise toothed or incised, or lobe, cleft, parted, etc., in the latter cases making it twice pinnatifid, twice palmately or pinnately lobed, parted or divided leaves, etc. From these illustrations one will perceive how the botanist, in two or three words, may describe any one of the almost endlessly diversified shapes of leaves, so as to give a clear and definite idea of it. Compound leaves. A compound leaf is one which has its blade in entirely separate parts, each usually with a stalklet of its own, and the stalklet is often joined or articulated with the main leaf stalk, just as this is jointed with the stem. When this is the case, there is no doubt that the leaf is compound, but when the pieces have no stalklets, they are not jointed with the main leaf stalk. It may be considered either as a divided simple leaf or a compound leaf, according to the circumstances. This is a matter of names where all intermediate forms may be expected. While the pieces or projecting parts of a simple leaf blade are called lobes, or in deeply cut leaves, etc., segments, or divisions, the separate pieces or blades of a compound leaf are called leaflets. Compound leaves are of two principal kinds, namely the pinnate and the palmate, answering to the two modes of veining in reticulated leaves, and to the two sorts of lobed or divided leaves. Pinnate leaves are those in which the leaflets are arranged on the sides of a main leaf stalk. They answer to the feather veined, example pinnately veined, simple leaf, as will be seen at once on comparing the forms. The leaflets of the former answer to the lobes or subdivisions of the latter, and the continuation of the petiole, along which the leaflets are arranged, answers to the midrib of the simple leaf. Three sorts of pinnate leaves are here given. Figure 156 is pinnate with an odd or end leaflet, as in the common locust and the ash. Figure 157 is pinnate with a tendril at the end, in place of the odd leaflet, as in the vetches and the pea. Figure 158 is evenly or abruptly pinnate, as in the honey locust. Palmate, also named digitate leaves, are those in which the leaflets are all born on the tip of the leaf stalk, as in the lupin, the common clover, the Virginia creeper, and the horse chestnut and buckeye. They evidently answer to the radiate veined or palmately veined simple leaf. That is, the clover leaf of three leaflets is the same as a palmately three ribbed leaf cut into three separate leaflets and such a simple five-lobed leaf as that of the sugar maple, if more cut so as to separate the parts, would produce a palmate leaf of five leaflets, like that of the horse chestnut or buckeye. Either sort of compound may have any number of leaflets, yet palmate leaves cannot well have a great many, since they are all crowded together on the end of the main leaf stalk. Some lupins have nine or eleven, the horse chestnut has seven, the sweet buckeye more commonly five, the clover three. A pinnate leaf often has only seven or five leaflets, or only three, as in beams of the genus Phaseolus, etc., in some rarer cases only two, 
in the orange and the lemon and also in the common barberry there is only one the joint at the place where the leaflet is united with the petiole distinguishes this last case from a simple leaf in other species of these genera the lateral leaflets also are present the leaflets of a compound leaf may be either entire or serrate or lobed cleft parted etc in fact may present all the variations of simple leaves and the same terms equally apply to them when the division is carried so far as to separate what would be one leaflet into two three or several the leaf becomes doubly or twice compound either pinnately or palmately as the case may be for example while the clustered leaves of the honey locust are simply pinnate that is once pinnate those on new shoots are bipinnate or twice pinnate when these leaflets are again divided in the same way the leaf becomes thrice pinnate or tripinnate as in many acacias the first divisions are called pinnae the others pinnules and the last or little blades themselves leaflets so the palmate leaf, if again compounded in the same way, becomes twice palmate, or as we say when the divisions are in threes, twice ternate, in Latin form, biternate. If a third time compounded, thrice ternate or triternate. But if the division goes still further, or if the degree is variable, we simply say that the leaf is decompound, either palmately or pinnately decompound as the case may be thus figure 161 represents a four times ternately compound in other words a ternately decompound leaf of a common meadow rue when the botanist in describing leaves wishes to express the number of the leaflets he may use terms like these unifoliolate for a compound leaf of a single leaflet from the latin unum one and foliolum leaflet bifoliolate of two leaflets from the latin bis twice and foliolum leaflet trifoliolate or ternate of three leaflets as the clover and so on palmately bifoliolate trifoliolate quadrifoliolate plurifoliolate of several leaflets etc or else pinnately bi tri quadri or plurifoliolate, that is, of two, three, four, five, or several leaflets, as the case may be. These are terse ways of denoting in single phrases both the number of leaflets and the kind of compounding. Of foliage leaves having certain peculiarities in structure, the following may be noted. Perfoliate leaves and these the stem that bears them seems to run through the blade of the leaf more or less above its base a common bellwort uvularia perfoliata is a similar illustration the lower and earlier leaves show it distinctly later the plant is apt to produce some leaves merely clasping the stem by the sessile and heart-shaped base and the latest may be merely sessile so the series explains the peculiarity in the formation of the leaf the bases meeting around the stem grow together there conate perfoliate such are the upper leaves of true honeysuckles here of the opposite and sessile leaves some pairs especially the uppermost in the course of their formation unite around the stem which thus seems to run through the disc formed by their union Equitant leaves. While ordinary leaves spread horizontally and present one face to the sky and the other to the earth, there are some that present their tip to the sky and their faces right and left to the horizon. Among these are the equitant leaves of the iris or flower de luce. Inspection shows that each leaf was formed as if folded together lengthwise, so that what would be the upper surface is within and all grown together except next the bottom where each leaf covers the next younger one it was from their straddling over each other like a man on horseback as is seen in the cross section 
that linnaeus with his lively fancy called these equitant leaves leaves with no distinction of petiole and blade the leaves of iris just mentioned show one form of this the flat but narrow leaves of jonquils daffodils and the cylindrical leaf of onions are other instances needle-shaped leaves like those of the pine larch and spruce and the awl-shaped as well as the scale-shaped leaves of junipers red cedar and arbor vitae are examples phylodia sometimes an expanded petiole takes the place of the blade as in numerous new holland acacias some of which are now common in greenhouses such counterfeit blades are called phylodia meaning leaf-like bodies they may be known from true blades by their standing edgewise, their margins being directed upwards and downwards, while in true blades the faces look upwards and downwards, except in equitant leaves, as already explained. Falsely vertical leaves. These are apparent exceptions to the rule, the blade standing edgewise instead of flatwise to the stem. But this position comes by a twist of the stalk or the base of the blade. Such leaves present the two faces about equally to the light. The compass plant, Silphium liciniatum, is an example. So also the leaves of Boltonia, or wild lettuce, and of a vast number of Australian myrtaceous shrubs and trees, which much resemble the phylodia of the acacias of the same country. They are familiar in Callistemon, the bottle brush flower, and the eucalyptus, but in the latter the leaves of the young tree have the normal structure and position. Cladophylla, meaning branch leaves. The foliage of Ruscus, the butcher's broom of Europe, and of Myrsiphilum of South Africa, cultivated for decoration under the false name of Smilax, is peculiar and puzzling. If these blades are really leaves, they are most anomalous in occupying the axil of another leaf, reduced to a little scale. Yet they have an upper and lower face, as leaves should, although they soon twist so as to stand more or less edgewise. If there are branches which have assumed exactly the form and office of leaves, they are equally extraordinary in not making any further development. But in Ruscus, flowers are born on one face, in the axle of a little scale, and this would seem to settle that they are branches. In asparagus, just the same things as to position are thread shaped and branch like. End of section seven. Recorded by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. Interface Audio dot com. Section eight of the Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 7 Leaves, Part 2 through 4. Part 2 Leaves of Special Conformation and Use Leaves for Storage A leaf may at the same time serve both ordinary and special uses. Thus in those leaves of lilies, such as the common white lily, which spring from the bulb, the upper and green part serves for foliage and elaborates nourishment, while the thickened portion or bud scale beneath serves for the storage of this nourishment. The thread-shaped leaf of the onion fulfills the same office, and the nourishing matter it prepares is deposited in its sheathing base, forming one of the concentric layers of the onion. When these layers, so thick and succulent, have given up their store to the growing parts within, they are left as thin and dry husks. In a house leek, an aloe, or an agave, the green color of the surface of the fleshy leaf indicates that it is doing the work of foliage. The deeper-seated white portion within is the storehouse of the nourishment, which the green surface has elaborated. 
so also the seed leaves or cotyledons are commonly used for storage some as in one of the maples the pea horse chestnut oak etc are for nothing else others as in beech and in our common beans give faint indication of service as foliage also chiefly in vain still others as in the pumpkin and flax having served for storage develop into the first efficient foliage compare eleven twenty two through thirty and the accompanying figures leaves as bud scales serve to protect the forming parts within having fulfilled this purpose they commonly fall off when the shoot develops and foliage leaves appear occasionally as in figure one seventy there is a transition of bud scales to leaves which reveals the nature of the former the lilac also shows a gradation from bud scale to simple leaf in cornus florida the flowering dogwood the four bud scales which through the winter protect the head of forming flowers remain until blossoming and then the base of each grows out into a large and very showy petal like leaf the original dry scale is apparent in the notch at the apex leaves as spines occur in several plants a familiar instance is that of the common barberry in almost any summer shoot most of the gradations may be seen between the ordinary leaves with sharp bristly teeth and leaves which are reduced to a branching spine or thorn the fact that the spines of the barberry produce a leaf bud in their axle also proves them to be leaves leaves for climbing are various in adaptation true foliage leaves serve this purpose as in gloriosa where the attenuated tip of a simple leaf otherwise like that of a lily hooks around a supporting object or in solanum jasminoides of the gardens and in morandia etc where the leaf stalk coils round and clings to a support or in the compound leaves of clematis and of adlumia in which both the leaflets and their stalks hook or coil around the support or in a compound leaf as in the pea and most vetches and in cobea while the lower leaflets serve for foliage some of the uppermost are developed as tendrils for climbing in the common pea this is so with all but one or two pairs of leaflets in one european vetch the leaflets are wanting and the whole petiole is a tendril while the stipules become the only foliage leaves as pitchers or hollow tubes are familiar in the common pitcher plant or side saddle flower of our bogs these pitchers are generally half full of water in which flies and other insects are drowned often in such numbers as to make a rich manure for the plant more curious are some of the southern species of saracenia which seem to be specially adapted to the capture and destruction of flies and other insects the leaf of the nepenthes combines three structures and uses the expanded part below is foliage this tapers into a tendril for climbing and this bears a pitcher with a lid insects are caught and perhaps digested in the pitcher leaves as fly traps insects are caught in another way and more expertly by the most extraordinary of all the plants of this country the dionea or venus's fly trap which grows in the sandy bogs around wilmington north carolina here each leaf bears at its summit an appendage which opens and shuts in shape something like a steel trap and operating much like one for when open no sooner does a fly alight on its surface and brush against any one of the two or three bristles that grow there than the trap suddenly closes capturing the intruder if the fly escapes the trap soon slowly opens and is ready for another capture when retained the insect is after a time moistened by a secretion from minute glands of the inner surface and is digested in the various species of drosera or sundew insects are caught by sticking fast to very viscid glands at the tip of strong bristles 
aided by adjacent gland-tipped bristles which bend slowly toward the captive. The use of such adaptations and operations may be explained in another place. A leaf complete in its parts consists of blade, leaf stalk, or petiole, and a pair of stipules. But most leaves have either frugaceous or minute stipules, or none at all. Many have no petiole, the blade being sessile or stalkless, and some have no clear distinction of blade and petiole. And many of these, such as those of the onion and all phyllodia, consist of petiole only. The base of the petiole is apt to be broadened and flattened, sometimes into thin margins, sometimes into a sheath which embraces the stem at the point of attachment. Stipules are such appendages, either wholly or partly separated from the petiole. When quite separate, they are said to be free, as in figure 112. When attached to the base of the petiole, as in the rose and in clover, they are adnate. When the two stipules unite and sheathe the stem above the insertion, as in polygonum, this sheath is called an ochrea, from its likeness to a grave or legon. In grasses, when the sheathing base of the leaf may answer to petiole, the summit of the sheath commonly projects as a thin and short membrane, like an ochrea. This is called a ligula or ligule. When stipules are green and leaf-like, they act as so much foliage. In the pea, they make up no small part of the actual foliage. In a related plant, Lathyrus afeca, they make the whole of it, the remainder of the leaf being tendril. In many trees, the stipules are the bud scales, as in the beech, and very conspicuously in the fig tree, tulip tree, and magnolia. These fall off as the leaves unfold. The stipules are spines or prickles in locust and several other leguminous trees and shrubs. They are tendrils in smilax or greenbrier. Phyllotaxy, meaning leaf arrangement, is the study of the position of leaves, or parts answering to leaves, upon the stem. The technical name for the attachment of leaves to the stem is the insertion. Leaves are inserted in three modes. They are alternate, that is, one after another, or in other words, with only a single leaf to each node, opposite, when there is a pair to each node, the two leaves in this case being always on opposite sides of the stem. Forald or verticillate, when there are more than two leaves on a node, in which case they divide the circle equally between them, forming a verticel or whorl. Then there are three leaves in the whorl. The leaves are one-third of the circumference apart, when four, one-quarter, and so on. So the plan of opposite leaves, which is very common, is merely that of whorled leaves with the fewest leaves to the whorl, namely two. In both modes and in all their modifications, the arrangement is such as to distribute the leaves systematically, and in a way to give them a good exposure to the light. No two or more leaves ever grow from the same point. The so-called fascicled or clustered leaves are the leaves of a branch the nodes of which are very close, just as they are in the bud, so keeping the leaves in a cluster. This is evident in the larch, in which examination shows each cluster to be made up of numerous leaves crowded on a spur or short axis. In spring there are only such clusters, but in summer some of them lengthen into ordinary shoots with scattered alternate leaves. So likewise each cluster of two or three needle-shaped leaves in pitch pines or of five leaves in white pine answers to a similar extremely short branch, springing from the axle of a thin and slender scale, which represents a leaf of the main shoot. For pines produce two kinds of leaves. One, primary, the proper leaves of the shoots, not as foliage, but in the shape of delicate scales in the spring, which soon fall away. And two, secondary, the fascicled leaves, from buds in the axils of the former, and these form the actual foliage. 
Phyllotaxy of alternate leaves. Alternate leaves are distributed along the stem in an order which is uniform for each species. The arrangement in all its modifications is said to be spiral, because if we draw a line from the insertion, i.e. the point of attachment, of one leaf to that of the next, and so on, this line will wind spirally around the stem as it rises, and in the same species will always bear the same number of leaves for each turn round the stem. That is, any two successive leaves will always be separated from each other by an equal portion of the circumference of the stem. The distance in height between any two leaves may vary greatly, even on the same shoot for that depends upon the length of the internodes or spaces between the leaves but the distance as measured around the circumference in other words the angular divergence or angle formed by any two successive leaves is uniformly the same two ranked the great possible divergence is of course where the second leaf stands on exactly the opposite side of the stem from the first the third on the side opposite the second and therefore over the first and the fourth over the second this brings all the leaves into two ranks one on one side of the stem and one on the other and is therefore called the two ranked arrangement it occurs in all grasses in indian corn for instance also in the basswood this is the simplest of all arrangements, and the one which most widely distributes successive leaves, but which therefore gives the fewest vertical ranks. Next is the three-ranked arrangement, that is, of all sedges and of white hellebore. Here the second leaf is placed one-third of the way round the stem, the third leaf two-thirds of the way round, and the fourth leaf accordingly directly over the first, the fifth over the second, and so on. That is, three leaves occur in each turn round the stem, and they are separated from each other by one-third of the circumference. Five-ranked is the next in the series, and the most common. It is seen in the apple, cherry, poplar, and the greater number of trees and shrubs. In this case, the line traced from leaf to leaf will pass twice round the stem before it reaches a leaf situated directly over any below. Here the sixth leaf is over the first. The leaves stand in five perpendicular ranks and with equal angular distance from each other, and this distance between any two successive leaves is just two-fifths of the circumference of the stem the five ranked arrangement is expressed by the fraction two-fifths this fraction denotes the divergence of the successive leaves i e the angle they form with each other the numerator also expresses the number of turns made round the stem by the spiral line in completing one cycle or set of leaves namely two and the denominator gives the number of leaves in each cycle or the number of perpendicular ranks, namely five. In the same way, the fraction one-half stands for the two-ranked mode, and one-third for the three-ranked. And so these different sorts are expressed by the series of fractions, one-half, one-third, two-fifths. Other cases follow in the same numerical progression, the next being the eighth-ranked arrangement. In this, the ninth leaf stands over the first, and three turns are made around the stem to reach it, so it is expressed by the fraction three-eighths. This is seen in the holly and in the common plantain. Then comes the thirteen-ranked arrangement, in which the fourteenth leaf is over the first, after five turns around the stem. The common house leek is a good example. The series so far then is one half, one third, two fifths, three eighths, five thirteenths, the numerator and the denominator of each fraction being those of the two next preceding ones added together. At this rate, the next higher should be eight twenty firsts, then thirteen thirty fourths, and so on. And in fact, just such cases are met with, and commonly no others. These higher sorts are found in the pine family 
both in the leaves and the cones and in many other plants with small and crowded leaves but in those the number of the ranks or of leaves in each cycle one can rarely be made out by direct inspection they may be indirectly ascertained however by studying the secondary spirals as they are called which usually become conspicuous at least two series of them one turning to the right and one to the left for an account of the way in which the character of the phyllotaxy may be deduced from the secondary spirals see structural botany chapter four Phyllotaxy of opposite and world leaves. This is simple and comparatively uniform. The leaves of each pair or whorl are placed over the intervals between those of the preceding, and therefore under the intervals of the pair or whorl next above. The whorls or pairs alternate or cross each other, usually at right angles. That is, they decussate opposite leaves that is whorls of two leaves only are far commoner than whorls of three or four or more members this arrangement in successive decussating pairs gives an advantageous distribution on the stem in four vertical ranks whorls of three give six vertical ranks and so on note that in descriptive botany leaves and whorls of two are simply called opposite leaves and that the term verticillate or whirled is employed only for cases of more than two unless the latter number is specified vernation or prefoliation the disposition of the leaf blades in the bud comprise two things first the way in which each separate leaf is folded coiled or packed up in the bud and second the arrangement of the leaves in the bud with respect to one another the latter, of course, depends very much upon the phyllotaxy, for example, the position and order of the leaves upon the stem. The same terms are used for it as the arrangement of the leaves of the flower in the flower bud. See, therefore, astivation or prefloration. As to each leaf separately, it is sometimes straight and open in vernation, but more commonly is either bent, folded, or rolled up when the upper part is bent down upon the lower as the young blade in the tulip tree is bent upon the leaf stalk it is said to be inflexed or reclined in vernation when folded by the midrib so that the two halves are placed face to face it is conduplicate as in the magnolia the cherry and the oak when folded back and forth like the plates of a fan it is plicate or plated in unrolling it resembles the head of a crozier and is said to be circinate or it may be rolled up parallel with the axis either from one edge into a coil when it is convolute as in the apricot and plum or rolled from both edges towards the midrib sometimes inwards when it is involute as in the violet and the water lily sometimes outward when it is revolute in the rosemary and azalea the figures are diagrams representing sections through the leaf in the way they were represented by linnaeus end of section 8 recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interfaceaudio.com Section 9 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. L I B R I V O X dot O R G. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Flowers, Parts 1 through 3 flowers are for the production of seed stems and branches which for a time put forth leaves for vegetation may at length put forth flowers for reproduction part one position and arrangement of flowers or inflorescence flower buds appear just where leaf buds appear that is they are either terminal or axillary 
Morphologically, flowers answer to shoots or branches, and their parts to leaves. In the same species, the flowers are usually from axillary buds only or from terminal buds only, but in some they are both axillary and terminal. Inflorescence, which is the name used by Linnaeus to signify mode of flower arrangement, is accordingly of three classes, namely indeterminate, when the flowers are in the axils of leaves, that is, are from axillary buds, determinate, when they are from terminal buds and so terminate a stem or branch, and mixed, when these two are combined. Indeterminate inflorescence, likewise and for the same reason called indefinite inflorescence, is so named because, as the flowers all come from axillary buds, the terminal bud may keep on growing and prolong the stem indefinitely. This is so in moneywort. When flowers thus arise singly from the axils of ordinary leaves, they are axillary and solitary, not collected into flower clusters. But when several or many flowers are produced near each other, the accompanying leaves are apt to be of smaller size or of different shape or character. Then they are called bracts, and the flowers thus brought together form a cluster. The kinds of flower clusters of the indeterminate class have received distinct names according to their form and disposition. They are principally raceme, corym, umbel, spike, head, spadix, catkin, and panicle. In defining these, it will be necessary to use some of the following terms of descriptive botany which relate to inflorescence. If a flower is stalkless, i.e. sits directly in the axle or other support, it is said to be sessile. If raised on a naked stalk of its own, it is pedunculate, and the stalk is a peduncle. A peduncle on which a flower cluster is raised is a common peduncle. That which supports each separate flower of the cluster is a partial peduncle, and is generally called a pedicel. The portion of the general stalk along which flowers are disposed is called the axis of inflorescence, or, when covered with sessile flowers, the rachis, backbone, and sometimes the receptacle. The leaves of a flower cluster generally are termed bracts, but when bracts of different orders are to be distinguished, those on the common peduncle or axis, and which have a flower in their axle, keep the name of bracts and those on the pedicels or partial flower stalks, if any, that of bractlets or bracteoles. The former is the preferable English name. A raceme is that form of flower cluster in which the flowers, each on their own footstalk or pedicel, are arranged along the sides of a common stalk or axis of inflorescence, as in the lily of the valley, currant, barberry, one section of cherry, etc., each flower comes from the axle of a small leaf or bract, which, however, is often so small that it might escape notice, and even sometimes, as in the mustard family, disappears altogether. The lowest blossoms of a raceme are, of course, the oldest, and therefore open first, and the order of blossoming is ascending from the bottom to the top. The summit, never being stopped by a terminal flower, may go on to grow and often does so, as in the common shepherd's purse, producing lateral flowers one after another for many weeks. A corym is the same as a raceme, except that it is flat and broad, either convex or level-topped. That is, a raceme becomes a corym by lengthening the lower pedicels while the uppermost remain shorter. The axis of a corym is short in proportion to the lower pedicels, by extreme shortening of the axis, the corym may be converted into an umbel, as in the milkweed, a sort of flower cluster where the pedicels all spring apparently from the same point, from the top of the peduncle, so as to resemble, when spreading, the rays of an umbrella, whence the name. Here, the pedicels are sometimes called the rays of the umbel, and the bracts, when brought in this way into a cluster or circle, form what is called an involucre. 
the corimb and the umbel being more or less level-topped, bringing the flowers into a horizontal plane or a convex form, the ascending order of development appears as centripetal. That is, the flowering proceeds from the margin or circumference regularly towards the center, the lower flowers of the former answering to the outer ones of the latter. In these three kinds of flower clusters, the flowers are raised on conspicuous pedicels or stalks of their own. The shortening of these pedicels, so as to render the flowers sessile or nearly so, converts a raceme into a spike and a corimb or an umbel into a head. A spike is a flower cluster with more or less lengthened axis, along which the flowers are sessile or nearly so as in the plantain. A head, or capitulum, is a round or roundish cluster of flowers, which are sessile on a very short axis or receptacle, as in the buttonball, buttonbush, and red clover. It is just what a spike would become if its axis were shortened, or an umbel if its pedicels were all shortened until the flowers became sessile, the head of the button bush is naked, but that of the thistle, of the dandelion and the like, is surrounded by empty bracts, which form an involucre. Two particular forms of the spike and the head have received particular names, namely the spadix and the catkin. A spadix is a fleshy spike or head with small and often imperfect flowers, as in the kaya, Indian turnip, sweet flag, etc., it is commonly surrounded or embraced by a peculiar enveloping leaf called a spathe. A catkin, or ament, is the name given to the scaly sort of spike of the birch and alder, the willow and poplar, and one sort of flower clusters of the oak, hickory, and the like, the so-called amentaceous trees. Compound flower clusters of these kinds are not uncommon. When the stalks, which in the simple umbel are the pedicels of single flowers themselves, branch into an umbel, a compound umbel is formed. This is the inflorescence of caraway, parsnip, and almost all of the great family of umbiliferous, umbel-bearing plants. The secondary or partial umbels of a compound umbel are umbelets. When the umbelets are subtended by an involucre, the secondary involucre is called an involucile. A compound raceme is a cluster of racemes racemosely arranged, as in Smilacina racemosa. A compound corim is a corim, some branches of which branch again in the same way, as in mountain ash. A compound spike is a spicately disposed cluster of spikes. A panicle, such as that of oats and many grasses, is a compound flower cluster of a more or less open sort, which branches with apparent irregularity, neither into corims nor racemes. It is, as it were, a raceme of which some of the pedicels have branched so as to bear a few flowers on pedicels of their own, while others remain simple. A compound panicle is one that branches in this way again and again. Determinate inflorescence is that in which the flowers are from terminal buds. The simplest case is that of a solitary terminal flower. This stops the growth of the stem, for its terminal bud, becoming a blossom, can no more lengthen in the manner of a leaf bud. Any further growth must be from axillary buds developing into branches. If such branches are leafy shoots, at length terminated by single blossoms, the inflorescence still consists of solitary flowers at the summit of stem and branches. But if the flowering branches bear only bracts in place of ordinary leaves, the result is the kind of flower cluster called a cyme. This is commonly a flat-topped or convex flower cluster, like a corimb, only the blossoms are from terminal buds. Consider the simplest cyme in a plant with opposite leaves, namely with three flowers. The middle flower terminates the stem. The two others terminate branches, one from the axle of each of the uppermost leaves, and being later than the middle one, the flowering proceeds from the center outwards, or is centrifugal. 
this is the opposite of the indeterminate mode or that where all the flower buds are axillary if flowering branches appear from the axils below the lower ones are the later so that the order of blossoming continues centrifugal or which is the same thing descending making a sort of reversed raceme or false raceme a kind of cluster which is to the true raceme just what the flat cyme is to the corymb wherever there are bracts or leaves buds may be produced from their axils and appear as flowers consider the case where branches each with a pair of small leaves or bracts about their middle have branched again and produced branchlets and flowers on each side it is the continued repetition of this which forms the full or compound cyme such as that of the loristinus hobblebush dogwood and hydrangea a fascicle meaning a bundle like that of the sweet william and lychnis of the gardens is only a cyme with the flowers much crowded a glomerule is a cyme still more compacted so as to imitate a head it may be known from a true head by the flowers not expanding centripetally that is not from the circumference towards the center the illustrations of determinate or cymose inflorescence have been taken from plants with opposite leaves which give rise to the most regular cymes but the rose cinquefoil buttercup etc with alternate leaves furnish also good examples of cymose inflorescence a cymule or diminutive cyme is either a reduced small cyme of few flowers or a branch of a compound cyme i e a partial cyme scorpioid or helicoid cymes of various sorts are forms of determinate inflorescence often puzzling to the student in which one half of the ramification fails to appear so that they may be called incomplete cymes the commoner forms may be understood by comparing a complete cyme with a cyme of an opposite leaved plant having a series of terminal flowers and the axis continued by the development of a branch in the axle of only one of the leaves at each node consider the wanting branches which if present would convert the scorpioid cyme into a complete one these are kinds of false racemes when the bracts are also wanting in such cases as in many boragineous plants the true nature of the inflorescence is very much disguised these distinctions between determinate and indeterminate inflorescence between corymbs and cymes and between the true and false raceme and spike were not recognized by botanists much more than half a century ago and even now are not always attended to in descriptions it is still usual and convenient to describe rounded or flat-topped and open ramification as corymbos even when essentially cymos also to call the reversed or false racemes or spikes by these strictly incorrect names mixed inflorescence is that in which the two plans are mixed or combined in compound clusters a mixed panicle is one in which while the primary ramification is of the indeterminate order the secondary or ultimate is wholly or partially of the determinate order a contracted or elongated inflorescence of this sort is called a thyrsus lilac and horse chestnut afford common examples of mixed inflorescence of this sort when loose and open such flower clusters are called by the general name of panicles the heads of compositae are centripetal but the branches or peduncles which bear the heads are usually of centrifugal order part two parts or organs of the flower these were simply indicated in section two some parts are necessary to seed bearing these are essential organs namely the stamens and pistils others serve for protection or for attraction often for both such are the leaves of the flower or the floral envelopes the floral envelopes taken together are sometimes called the perianth also perigon in latin form perigonium in a flower which possesses its full number of organs 
the floral envelopes are of two kinds namely an outer circle the calyx and an inner the corolla the calyx is commonly a circle of green or greenish leaves but not always it may be the most brightly colored part of the blossom each calyx leaf or piece is called a sepal the corolla is the inner circle of floral envelopes or flower leaves usually of delicate texture and colored that is of some other color than green each corolla leaf is called a petal there are flowers in abundance which consist wholly of floral envelopes such are the so-called full double flowers of which the choicer roses and camellias of the cultivator are familiar examples in them under the gardener's care and selection petals have taken the place of both stamens and pistils these are monstrous or unnatural flowers incapable of producing seed and subservient only to human gratification their common name of double flowers is not a sensible one except that it is fixed by custom it were better to translate their latin name flores pleni and call them full flowers meaning full of leaves moreover certain plants regularly produce neutral flowers consisting of floral envelopes only some are seen around the margin of the cyme and hydrangea they are likewise familiar in the hobble bush and in wild cranberry tree viburnum oxycoxus where they form an attractive setting to the cluster of small and comparatively inconspicuous perfect flowers which they adorn in the gilder rose or snowball of ornamental cultivation all or most of the blossoms of this same shrub are transformed into neutral flowers the essential organs are likewise of two kinds placed one above or within the other namely first the stamens or fertilizing organs and second the pistils which are to be fertilized and bear the seeds a stamen consists of two parts namely the filament or stalk and the anther the latter is the only essential part it is a case commonly with two lobes or cells each opening lengthwise by a slit at the proper time and discharging a powder or dust-like substance usually of a yellow color this powder is the pollen or fertilizing matter to produce which is the office of the stamen a pistil when complete has three parts ovary style and stigma the ovary at base is the hollow portion which contains one or more ovules or rudimentary seeds the style is the tapering portion above the stigma is a portion of the style usually its tip with moist naked surface upon which grains of pollen may lodge and adhere and thence make a growth which extends down to the ovules when there is no style then the stigma occupies the tip of the ovary the torus or receptacle is the end of the flower stalk or the portion of axis or stem out of which the several organs of the flower grow upon which they are born the parts of the flower are thus disposed on the receptacle or axis essentially as are leaves upon a very short stem first the sepals or outer floral leaves then the petals or inner floral leaves then the stamens lastly at summit or center the pistils when there are two or more of them or the single pistil when only one consider the organs two of each kind of such a simple and symmetrical flower as that of a sedum or stone crop part three plan of flower all flowers are formed upon one general plan but with almost infinite variations and many disguises this common plan is best understood by taking for a type or standard for comparison some perfect complete regular and symmetrical blossom and one as simple as such a blossom could well be flowers are said to be perfect or hermaphrodite when provided with both kinds of essential organs i e with both stamens and pistils complete when besides they have the two sets of floral envelopes namely calyx and corolla 
such are completely furnished with all that belongs to a flower regular when all the parts of each set are alike in shape and size symmetrical when there is an equal number of parts in each set or circle of organs flax flowers were taken for a pattern in section two but in them the five pistils have their ovaries as it were consolidated into one body sedum has the pistils and all the other parts free from such combination the flower is perfect complete regular and symmetrical but is not quite as simple as it might be for there are twice as many stamens as there are of the other organs crassula a relative of sedum cultivated in the conservatories for winter blossoming is simpler being isostemonous or with just as many stamens as petals or sepals while sedum is diplostemonous having double that number it has indeed two sets of stamens numerical plan a certain number either runs through the flower or is discernible in some of its parts this number is most commonly either five or three not very rarely four occasionally two thus the ground plan of the flowers thus far used for illustration is five that of trillium is three as it likewise is as really if not as plainly in tulips and lilies crocuses iris and all that class of blossoms in some sedums all the flowers are in fours in others the first flowers are on the plan of five the rest mostly on the plan of four that is with four sepals four petals eight stamens i e twice four and four pistils whatever the ground number may be it runs through the whole in symmetrical blossoms alternation of the successive circles in these flowers the parts of the successive circles alternate and such is the rule that is the petals stand over the intervals between the sepals the stamens when of the same number stand over the intervals between the petals or when twice as many as in the trillium the outer set alternates with the petals and the inner set alternating with the other of course stands before the petals and the pistils alternate with these this is just as it should be on the theory that the circles of the blossom answer to whorls of leaves which alternate in this way while in such flowers the circles are to be regarded as whorls in others they are rather to be regarded as condensed spirals of alternate leaves but however this may be in the mind of a morphological botanist flowers are altered branches and their parts therefore altered leaves that is certain buds which might have grown and lengthened into a leafy branch do under other circumstances and to accomplish other purposes develop into blossoms in these the axis remains short nearly as it is in the bud the leaves therefore remain close together in sets or circles the outer ones those of the calyx generally partake more or less of the character of foliage the next set are more delicate and form the corolla while the rest the stamens and pistils appear under forms very different from those of ordinary leaves and are concerned in the production of seed this view gives to botany an interest which one who merely notices the shape and counts the parts of blossoms without understanding their plan has no conception of that flowers answer to branches may be shown first from their position as explained in the section on inflorescence flowers arise from the same places as branches and from no other flower buds like leaf buds appear either on the summit of a stem that is as a terminal bud or in the axle of a leaf as an axillary bud and as the plan of a symmetrical flower shows the arrangement of the parts on their axis or receptacle is that of leaves upon the stem that the sepals and petals are of the nature of leaves is evident from their appearance they are commonly called the leaves of the flower the calyx is most generally green in color and foliaceous leaf-like in texture and though the corolla is rarely green yet neither are proper leaves always green 
in our wild painted cup and in some scarlet sages common in gardens the leaves just under the flowers are of the brightest red or scarlet often much brighter colored than the corolla itself and sometimes as in many cactuses and in carolina allspice there is such a regular gradation from the last leaves of the plant bracts or bracklets into the leaves of the calyx that it is impossible to say where one ends and the other begins if sepals are leaves so also are petals for there is no clearly fixed limit between them not only in the carolina allspice and cactus but in the water lily and in a variety of flowers with more than one row of petals there is such a complete transition between calyx and corolla that no one can surely tell how many of the leaves belong to the one and how many to the other that stamens are of the same general nature as petals and therefore a modification of leaves is shown by the gradual transitions that occur between the one and the other in many blossoms especially in cultivated flowers such as roses and camellias when they begin to double that is to change their stamens into petals some wild and natural flowers show the same interesting transitions the carolina allspice and the white water lily exhibit complete gradations not only between sepals and petals but between petals and stamens the sepals of our water lily are green outside but white and petal like on the inside the petals in many rows gradually grow narrower towards the center of the flower some of these are tipped with a trace of a yellow anther but still are petals the next are more contracted and stamen-like but with a flat petal-like filament and a further narrowing of this completes the genuine stamen pistils and stamens now and then change into each other in some willows pistils often turn into petals in cultivated flowers and in the double cherry they are occasionally replaced by small green leaves sometimes a whole blossom changes into a cluster of green leaves as in the green roses occasionally noticed in gardens and sometimes it degenerates into a leafy branch so the botanist regards pistils also as answering to leaves that is to single leaves when simple and separate to a whorl of leaves when conjoined end of section nine recording by mackenzie nicole greenwood for LibriVox.org in February of 2018. Section 10 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Parts 4 and 5. 4. Modifications of the Type. The deviations, as they may be called, from the assumed type or pattern of flower are most various and extensive. The differences between one species and another of the same genus are comparatively insignificant. Those between different genera are more striking those between different families and classes of plants more and more profound they represent different adaptations to conditions or modes of life some of which have obvious or probable utilities although others are beyond particular explanation the principal modifications may be conveniently classified first those which in place of perfect otherwise called hermaphrodite or bisexual flowers give origin to unisexual or separated or diclinous flowers imperfect flowers as they have been called in contradistinction to perfect flowers but that term is too ambiguous in these some flowers want the stamens while others want the pistils taking hermaphrodite flowers as the pattern it is natural to say that the missing organs are suppressed this expression is justified by the very numerous cases in which the missing parts are abortive that is are represented by rudiments or vestiges which serve to exemplify the plan although useless as to office unisexual flowers are monoecious i e of one household when flowers of both sorts or sexes are produced by the same individual plant as in the ricinus or castor oil plant dioecious i e of separate households 
when the two kinds are born on different plants as in willows poplars hemp and moonseed polygamous when the flowers are some of them perfect and some staminate or pistillate only a blossom having stamens and no pistil is a staminate or male flower sometimes it is called a sterile flower not appropriately for other flowers may equally be sterile one having pistil but no stamens is a pistillate or female flower incomplete flowers are so named in contradistinction to complete they want either one or both of the floral envelopes some are incomplete having calyx but no corolla so is the flower of anemone although its calyx is colored like a corolla the flowers of sororus or lizard's tail although perfect have neither calyx nor corolla incomplete flowers accordingly are naked or acclimatious destitute of both floral envelopes or apetalous when wanting only the corolla the case of corolla present and calyx wholly wanting is extremely rare although there are seeming instances in fact a single or simple perianth is taken to be a calyx unless the absence or abortion of a calyx can be made evident in contradistinction to regular and symmetrical very many flowers are irregular that is with the members of some or all of the floral circles unequal or dissimilar and unsymmetrical that is when the circles of the flower or some of them differ in the number of their members symmetrical and unsymmetrical are used in a different sense in some recent books but the older use should be adhered to want of numerical symmetry and irregularity commonly go together and both are common indeed few flowers are entirely symmetrical beyond calyx corolla and perhaps stamens and probably no irregular blossoms are quite symmetrical irregular and unsymmetrical flowers may therefore be illustrated together beginning with cases which are comparatively free from other complications the blossom of mustard and of all the very natural family which it represents is regular but unsymmetrical in the stamens there are four equal sepals four equal petals but six stamens and only two members in the pistil which for the present may be left out of view the want of symmetry is in the stamens these are in two circles an outer and an inner the outer circle consists of two stamens only the inner has its proper number of four the flower of violet which is on the plan of five is symmetrical in calyx corolla and stamens inasmuch as each of these circles consists of five members but it is conspicuously irregular in the corolla one of the petals being very different from the rest the flowers of larkspur and of monkshood or aconite which are nearly related are both strikingly irregular in calyx and corolla and considerably unsymmetrical in larkspur the irregular calyx consists of five sepals one of which larger than the rest is prolonged behind into a large sac or spur but the corolla is of only four petals of two shapes the fifth needed to complete the symmetry being left out and the monk's hood has five very dissimilar sepals and a corolla of only two very small and curiously shaped petals the three needed to make up the symmetry being left out the stamens in both are out of symmetry with the ground plan being numerous so are the pistils which are usually diminished to three sometimes to two or to one flowers with multiplication of parts are very common the stamens are indefinitely numerous in larkspur and in monkshood while the pistils are fewer than the ground plan suggests most cactus flowers have all the organs much increased in number and so of the water lily in anemone the stamens and pistils are multiplied while the petals are left out in buttercups or crowfoot while the sepals and petals conform to the ground plan of five both stamens and pistils are indefinitely multiplied flowers modified by union of parts so that these parts more or less lose the appearance of separate leaves or other organs growing out of the end of the stem or receptacle are extremely common there are two kinds of such union namely coalescence of parts of the same circle by their contiguous margins and adnation or the union of adjacent circles or unlike parts coalescence is not rare in leaves as in the upper pairs of honeysuckles 
it may all the more be expected in the crowded circles or whorls of flower leaves detura or stramonium shows this coalescence both in calyx and corolla the five sepals and the five petals being thus united to near their tips each into a tube or long and narrow cup these unions make needful the following terms gamma petalus said of a corolla the petals of which are thus coalescent into one body whether only at base or higher the union may extend to the very summit as in morning glory and the like so that the number of petals in it may not be apparent the old name for this was monopetalus but that means one petaled while gamma petalus means petals united and therefore is the proper term polypetalus is the counterpart term to denote a corolla of distinct that is separate petals as it means many petaled it is not the best possible name but it is the old one and an almost universal use gamma sepalus applies to the calyx when the sepals are in this way united polysepalus to the calyx one of separate sepals or calyx leaves degree of union or of separation in descriptive botany is expressed in the same way as in the lobing of leaves a corolla when gamma petalis commonly shows a distinction between a contracted tubular portion below the tube and the spreading part above the border or limb the junction between tube and limb or a more or less enlarged upper portion of the tube between the two is the throat the same is true of the calyx some names are given to particular forms of the gamma petalis corolla applicable also to a gamma sepalis calyx such as wheel-shaped or rotate when spreading out at once without a tube or with very short one something in the shape of a wheel or of its diverging spokes salver shaped or salver form when a flat spreading border is raised on a narrow tube from which it diverges at right angles like the salver represented in old pictures with a slender handle beneath bell-shaped or campanulate where a short and broad tube widens upward in the shape of a bell funnel-shaped or funnel form gradually spreading at the summit of a tube which is narrow below in the shape of a funnel or tunnel as in the corolla of the common morning glory and of the stramonium tubular when prolonged into a tube with little or no spreading at the border as in the corolla of the trumpet honeysuckle the calyx of stramonium etc although sepals and petals are usually all blade or lamina like a sessile leaf yet they may have a contracted and stalk-like base answering to a petiole this is called its claw in latin unguis unguiculate petals are universal and strongly marked in the pink tribe as in soapwort such petals and various others may have an outgrowth of the inner face into an appendage or fringe as in soapwort and in selene where it is at the junction of claw and blade this is called a crown or corona in passion flowers the crown consists of numerous threads on the base of each petal irregular flowers may be polypetalous or nearly so as in the papilinaceous corolla but most of them are irregular through coalescence which often much disguises the numerical symmetry also as affecting the corolla the following forms have received particular names papilinaceous corolla this is polypetalous except that two of the petals cohere usually but slightly it belongs only to the leguminous or pulse family the name means butterfly-like but the likeness is hardly obvious the names of the five petals of the papilinaceous corolla are curiously incongruous they are the standard or banner vexillum the large upper petal which is external in the bud and wrapped around the others the wings aloe the pair of side petals of quite different shape from the standard the keel carina the two lower and usually smallest petals these are lightly coalescent into a body which bears some likeness not to the keel but to the prow of a boat and this encloses the stamens and pistil a pea blossom is a typical example consider a species of locust robinia hispida labiate corolla which would more properly have been called bilabiate that is two-lipped this is a common form of gamma petalus corolla and the calyx is often bilabiate also 
these flowers are all on the plan of five and the irregularity in the corolla is owing to unequal union of the petals as well as to diversity of form the two petals of the upper or posterior side of the flower unite with each other higher up than with the lateral petals forming the upper lip the lateral and the lower similarly unite to form the lower lip the single notch which is generally found at the summit of the upper lip and the two notches of the lower lip or in other words the two lobes of the upper and the three of the lower lip reveal the real composition so also does the alternation of these five parts with those of the calyx outside when the calyx is also bilabiate as in the sage this alternation gives three lobes or sepals to the upper and two to the lower lip two forms of the labiate corolla have been designated ringent or gaping when the orifice is wide open personate or masked when a protuberance or intrusion of the base of the lower lip called a palate projects over or closes the orifice as in snapdragon and toad flax there are all gradations between labiate and regular corollas in those of gerardia of some species of penstemon and of catalpa the labiate character is slight but is manifest on close inspection in almost all such flowers the plan of five which is obvious or ascertainable in the calyx and corolla is obscured in the stamens by the abortion or suppression of one or three of their number ligulate corolla the ligulate or strap-shaped corolla mainly belongs to the family of compositae in which numerous small flowers are gathered into a head within an involucre that imitates a calyx it is best exemplified in the dandelion and in chicory each one of these straps or ligules looking like so many petals is the corolla of a distinct flower the base is a short tube which opens out into the ligule the five minute teeth at the end indicate the number of constituent petals so this is a kind of gamma corolla which is open along one side nearly to the base and outspread the nature of such a corolla and of the stamens also to be explained in the next section is illustrated by the flower of a lobelia in asters daisies sunflower coreopsis and the like only the marginal or ray corollas are ligulate the rest those of the disc are regularly gamapetalous tubular and five-lobed at summit but they're small and individually inconspicuous only the ray flowers making a show in fact those of coreopsis and of sunflower are simply for show these ray flowers being not only sterile but neutral that is having neither stamens nor pistil but in asters daisies goldenrods and the like these ray flowers are pistillate and fertile serving therefore for seed bearing as well as for show let it not be supposed that the show is useless adnation or consolidation is the union of the members of parts belonging to different circles of the flower it is of course understood that in this as likewise in coalescence the parts are not formed and then conjoined but are produced in union they are born united as the term adnate implies to illustrate this kind of union take this series of flowers first in the flax flower there is no adnation sepals petals and stamens are free as well as distinct being separately born on the receptacle one circle within or above the next only the five pistils have their ovaries coalescent in a cherry flower the petals and stamens are born on the throat of the calyx tube that is the sepals are coalescent into a cup and the petals and stamens are adnate to the inner face of this in other words the sepals petals and stamens are all consolidated up to a certain height in a purslane flower the same parts are adnate to or consolidated with the ovary up to its middle in a hawthorn flower the consolidation has extended over the whole ovary and petals and stamens are adnate to the calyx still further in a cranberry blossom it is the same except that all the parts are free at the same height all seem to arise from the top of the ovary in botanical description to express tersely such differences in the relation of these organs to the pistil they are said to be hypogenous when they are all free that is not adnate to pistil nor conate with each other 
periginous around the pistil when conate with each other, that is, when petals and stamens are inserted or borne on the calyx, whether as in cherry flowers, they are free from the pistil, or as in purslane and hawthorn, they are also adnate below to the ovary. Epigenous, on the ovary, when so adnate that all these parts appear to arise from the very summit of the ovary. The last two terms are not very definitely distinguished. Another and a simpler form of expression is to describe parts of the flower as being free when not united with or inserted upon other parts. Distinct when parts of the same kind are not united. This term is the counterpart of coalescent, as free is the counterpart of adnate. Many writers use the term free indiscriminately for both, but it is better to distinguish them. Conate is a term common for either not free or not distinct that is, for parts united congenitally, whether of the same or of different kinds. Adnate, as properly used, relates to the union of dissimilar parts. In still another form of expression, the terms superior and inferior have been much used in the sense of above and below. Superior is said of the ovary of flax flower, cherry, etc., because above the other parts. It is equivalent to ovary-free, or it is said of the calyx, etc., when above the ovary. Inferior, when applied to the ovary, means the same as calyx adnate. When applied to the floral envelopes, it means that they are free. Position of flower or of its parts. The terms superior and inferior, or upper and lower, are also used to indicate the relative position of the parts of a flower in reference to the axis of inflorescence. An axillary flower stands between the bract or leaf which subtends it and the axis or stem which bears this bract or leaf. This may be represented in sectional diagrams by a transverse line for the bract and a small circle for the axis of inflorescence. Now the side of the blossom which faces the bract is the anterior or inferior or lower side, while the side next to the axis is the posterior or superior or upper side of the flower. So, in the labiate corolla, the lip which is composed of three of the five petals is the anterior, or inferior, or lower lip. The other is the posterior, or superior, or upper lip. In violets, the odd sepal is posterior, next to the axis. The odd petal is therefore anterior, or next to the subtending leaf. In the papilinaceous flower, the odd sepal is anterior, and so two sepals are posterior. Consequently, by the alternation, the odd petal, the standard, is posterior or upper, and the two petals forming the keel are anterior or lower. 5. Arrangement of Parts in the Bud Estivation was the fanciful name given by Linnaeus to denote the disposition of the parts, especially the leaves of the flower, before anthesis, i.e. before the blossom opens. Prefloration, a better term, is sometimes used. This is of importance in distinguishing different families or genera of plants, being generally uniform in each. The estivation is best seen by making a slice across the flower bud. The pieces of the calyx or the corolla either overlap each other in the bud or they do not. When they do not overlap, the estivation is valvate when the pieces meet each other by their abrupt edges without any infolding or overlapping, as the calyx of the linden or basewood. In duplicate, which is valvate, with the margins of each piece projecting inwards, as in the calyx of a common virgin's bower. In volute, which is the same, but the margins rolled inward, as in most of the large-flowered species of clematis. Reduplicate, a rarer modification of valvate, is similar but with margins projecting outward. Open, the parts not touching in the bud, as the calyx of mignonette. When the pieces overlap in the bud, it is in one of two ways. Either every piece has one edge in and one edge out, or some pieces are wholly outside and others wholly inside. In the first case, the estivation is convolute, also named contorted or twisted. A cross-section of a corolla very strongly thus convolute or rolled up together and in the corolla of a flax flower, where the petals only moderately overlap in this way. Here, one edge of every petal covers the next before it, 
while its other edge is covered by the next behind it. The other mode is the imbricate or imbricated, in which the outer parts cover or overlap the inner, so as to break joints like tiles or shingles on a roof, whence the name. When the parts are three, the first or outermost is wholly external, the third wholly internal. The second one has one margin covered by the first, while the other overlaps the third or innermost piece. This is the arrangement of alternate three-ranked leaves. When there are five pieces, two are external, two are internal, and one, the third in the spiral, has one edge covered by the outermost, while its other edge covers the innermost, which is just the five-ranked arrangement of alternate leaves. When the pieces are four, two are outer and two are inner, which answers to the arrangement of opposite leaves. The imbricate and convolute modes sometimes vary one into the other, especially in the corolla. In a gamma petalous corolla or gamma sepalous calyx, the shape of the tube in the bud may sometimes be noticeable. It may be plicate or plated, that is, folded lengthwise, and the plates may either be turned outwards, forming projecting ridges, as in the corolla of Campanula, or turned inwards, as in that of Gentian belladonna, or supervolute, when the plates are convolutely wrapped round each other, as in the corolla of Morning Glory and of Stramonium. End of section 10. Recording by Mackenzie Nicole Greenwood for LibriVox.